All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here, coming at you poop, with another driving vlog. And today I'm just leaving class for the day at uh, Western Michigan, and I uh, thought I'd do a little driving vlog to uh, just talk about some things. And uh, sorry if I sound a little stuffed up right now. My leg's really itchy, so. <laughs> but uh, kind of getting over a bit of a cold or whatever. Could be allergies, I'm not sure. So apologies for all the grossness that you may see and hear in this video. But I thought I'd get some, uh, some thoughts out regardless. And uh, yeah, I was listening back to one of my older videos. And I do this from time to time just for, uh, for mostly technical reasons because uh, I think it's good for uh, video makers, YouTubers, whatever you want to call them, to uh, listen back to their videos on different uh, platforms. You know, I think you should do it with headphones in uh, your computer, you should do it with the speakers on, then you should do it, you know, in your car, you should do it with uh, headphones on, on your cell phone, I think, is, uh, is really good because you get to hear how sound plays out in different uh, scenarios. So, like, I was listening back to my September 2016 update video, and on my computer it sounded pretty good with the headphones on, but with speakers it sounded like the music was really, really low. But then I listened to it on my cell phone with the headphones, and the music sounded just fine. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I try to uh, mix it for people on the go, listening to it on uh, their headphones with their cell phones and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I gear my mixes towards. So uh, if you're wondering, why is the music so low? You know, <laughs> probably not listening to it on your cell phone with your headphones in. Most likely, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, I was listening back to my uh, my I Miss Japan uh, driving vlog, so I was kind of inspired to uh, to do another one, right? So, uh, yeah, um, this month actually marks my uh, one year anniversary of leaving Japan. So, uh, sorry, bug flying around here. But uh, anyway, so this year, this month marks my one year anniversary of leaving Japan, and uh, I want to do like a, a proper you know, what I've accomplished in that year, or whatever kind of video. But uh, I thought I'd just kind of sit uh, just sit here while I'm driving and uh, just kind of talk off the top of my head about uh, what the impact of me being in Japan is. And I'm sorry, I gotta, I gotta roll the windows down a little bit because otherwise I'm just gonna fucking pass out in this car. So sorry about the extra wind noise and cars and all that kind of shit, but I gotta breathe here, so apologies for that. Apologies for breathing. Anyway, um, so it's been a year, moved from Japan to uh, originally back to Ohio, back to my hometown, uh, stay with my folks for a couple months, waiting for the semester to begin at the beginning of this year, 2016, and uh, Got an apartment up here in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, starting class over at Western. Um, and uh, it's just been a big transition year for me because, you know, not only have I left Japan to move back to America, but I've also gotten out of the Navy, which I've been in for the past five years. And I'm also starting uh, college classes again, which is the first time I've done that in, uh, I think, over a decade, almost a decade. I think it's, no, it's, actually, I correct myself. It's a decade this semester. So it would have been, you know, nine years and whatever amount of months when I originally started uh, college at Western at the beginning of this year. But anyway, semantics. <laughs> so just doing all these different major life changes, and with that comes a lot of uh, just stress and just trying to deal with all these different changes in, in my life. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, it was hard. And I look back at some of my uh, posts and some of my videos during that initial time. 
Uh, and it's just, it's kind of hard to look back at him because I, I can feel how angry and hurt I was from those videos. And uh, it's just, it's, it's hard to look back on. But I think, I, I equate it somewhat to like unemployment. Like if you worked at a job for a long time, and you all of a sudden either quit or get fired or whatever the case may be, but you don't work there anymore. I kind of equate it to, you know, unemployment and that the first, you know, week or two or three is pretty okay. It's like you're on vacation. That's how it was for me um, coming back, you know, to America, back home in Ohio. I just felt like I was on leave, you know, I was just sitting around, not really doing anything for the first week, just relaxing and <coughs> taking it easy after running myself ragged for the past couple months, so I figured, eh, I earned a break, you know, <laughs> so I sat around for a month, or not a month, a week, and then the next week came around, and that was usually, at least when I came home on leave, usually the first week was kind of recovery week, you know, I'd stay, stay with my folks, chill out, whatever, then the next week would be where I'd go hang out with friends, and that's what I was kind of looking forward to, to, uh, to doing, that second, third week I was coming back after I came back rather and uh, it just it didn't really happen I mean I hung out with uh, a couple of my friends I remember hanging out with Zach Phoenix 787 on the YouTube so we did a couple videos together of our time hanging out in Cincinnati uh, so that was fun but ultimately pretty short-lived and uh, I tried calling some of my other friends but uh, you know they got their own lives now and uh, that's something else that, you know, veterans got to, especially the younger veterans. I mean, if you're, you know, well into your 30s, 40s and up, you know, it's kind of, kind of understand it a bit better. But for the, you know, 20s to early 30s vets like myself, uh, it can be a bit hard to wrap your head around that you spent all this time in the military doing your thing and living a very closed off life because you know, the military is everything and you live for the mission and stuff like that. And when you finally are out of that environment, it can be kind of shocking because, uh, you know, I think some people have this misconception of the world sort of being put on pause when you enlist. You know, it's just like, okay, I'm leaving my old life behind and I'm gonna go do this new thing in the military, and uh, I'm just gonna put a pause on my old life, and then when I get out, uh, I'll just unpause it, and everything will be back to normal, just the way it was, just ha like how I remember it when I left. And, <coughs> you know, in some cases it may be the same, you know, you may encounter, you know, the same buildings and the same stores of uh, your pre-military life, but uh, a lot of the people especially the people that you hung out with either aren't there anymore or they've changed dramatically, you know? Maybe when you enlisted or were commissioned, whatever, you, uh, you hung out with your friends a lot because they were single or maybe they had a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And uh, come to find out when you joined a couple years after that, you know, they got married and had a couple kids, and now they're living this totally different life than, uh, than before. And so, that can be really hard to wrap your head around. You may think, oh, my friends abandoned me. Nobody fucking cares about me. And, you know, I experienced a lot of that when I first came back home because, you know, I figured it was just going to be like leave, but really, really long instead of just two weeks like I normally did. It would just be like a three month vacation. <laughs> Extraordinaire. But, uh, you know, I didn't have the added budget of the Navy. I had my savings, but that savings was for, for a particular purpose. It wasn't just to go blow money for the sake of blowing money, you know, just because I was in town. You know, it had very real practical purposes, so I couldn't just tap into it whenever. And, uh, just a lot of things were different, man, you know? <laughs>
it wasn't a case of, well, Andy's only going to be in town for a couple weeks, so I better go hang out with him because I may not see him for a while. It's just, well, you know, Andy's going to be there for like a couple months, maybe longer. You know, he, he's back, so you know, we'll go hang out with him whenever. And, you know, one thing led to another. You know, they got work, kids, and all some stuff. And, and anyway, and th this is by no means a bash on my friends for, you know, abandoning me or not wanting to hang out with me for whatever reason. You know, this is just simply reality, you know? Life goes on with or without you. And that's just the simple reality of it. And uh, it can be really difficult for people to, to understand that. And it was really hard for me to understand that as well. And I know, you know, especially coming back from overseas, being in Japan for two, two plus years, like I was, you know, I was used to the culture, just the way they did things. And uh, when I came back to America, it's just, <laughs> it was not like that at all. You know, it's not very, you know, there's a lot of impolite people, especially, you know, in a city as big as Kalamazoo, you know? I mean, it's not a big city, but it's not a little, little small town or anything like that. You know, there's a lot of big city mentality, a lot of different races and different income classes that you can see pretty clearly, and it's, you know, it just simply is what it is. And, uh, you know, it's hard for me to, to really grasp that, like, you know, I understood it, but I didn't, like, it didn't really sink in, I guess, is what I mean to say. So, uh, there was a lot of disconnect on my end from everybody. I just felt like it was just me, and then everybody else was just kind of there. And I, I felt disconnected from everybody, from my friends, my folks, you know, my relatives, everybody. I just felt like, you know, I was in this very uninviting land, and then you'd hear all this sensationalist stuff in the news, and I think that also didn't really help the place. In fact, it made it worse. Of, you know, oh, somebody got ran over, somebody got shot with a gun out here the other day, there was an armed robbery somewhere, and it's just like, pretty soon you get to thinking, like, why did, why did I even come back to America to begin with? You know, if all this shit's going on. But, you know, after a while, you start to... And I think the thing that really helped me was getting a job. Giving me some sense of purpose and focus. Even though school is kind of supposed to be like that too, but... I don't know, I was still getting used to the academic way of doing things. Because I'd been out for over a decade. And at least with work... It was, you know, manual labor. It was something that was easy. I didn't really have to think a lot. It was just a lot of stuff made sense. And so I could just do something like that to distract my brain. <coughs> Excuse me. So that way it was just easier for me to adapt. And, you know, once I found a job, it just, I think that really helped give me a sense of purpose again. Even though it is working a little rinky-dink McDonald's, it's not exactly not exactly changing lives here, but it uh, gives me something to do, gives me a little extra pocket cash, so, you know, can't complain too much. And uh, half off food. <laughs> Except when I work, then I get a, a meal on the house. In the house of Mickey D's. But, uh, yeah, so it's just... Uh, once I got that, it, it kind of helped even me out a little bit. I got a lot less worried about bills and stuff because that was another stressor. It wasn't just, you know, readapting to all these different things. It was also trying to pay the bills because the GI Bill is a, a very unstable source of income because it's based off of how many days you go to school. And on days where you go to school the whole month, you know, it's great. You know, you don't have to really worry about bills or any other stuff. But if you go on like a spring break or a winter break or something like that, then, uh, you know, you pretty much have to foot the bill yourself to cover the difference. So I had to do that with my savings for a lot of months, you know, a couple, like about a month, like the first month before the GI Bill actually kicked in, I had to, uh, live entirely off of savings and you know 
anybody who's gone to college knows that first month is the worst because, you know, you got to pay for all this different shit. Excuse <coughs> me. And just everything is so expensive, but you have to get it or else you fail the class. And it's like, ugh, can't deal right now. So, uh, yeah, that was extremely stressful and I tapped out a lot of my savings doing that. So, you know, we'll just go in here real quick. I think I gotta get some gas. But, uh, yeah, I'm just thankful that I made it out the other side in one piece. I know that there are a lot of veterans out there who can't say that, you know. They, once they got to the outside, they had some problems and, you know, either led to suicide or excessive drug use or both. <laughs> and uh, thankful to say I'm still alive. Heart's still ticking for the time being. Uh, so, just thankful that I get to continue to live this life. And, uh, yeah, just gonna keep going until I can't go no mo. And, uh, with that said, this is the Andy Son. Sign up for now, thanking you guys for tuning into this uh, little driving vlog and for watching my other stuff. Also, want to thank you guys for liking, with the thumbs, commenting, subscribing, send a few friends to the party. And hey, as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye.